Hello everyone, my name is John Hammond, and this is another Try Hack Me video because I know a lot of you guys have been uh, loving that lately and I want to get back at it. So let's dive in, I'll hop over to my computer screen here so you guys can follow along, and I'm going to be tackling that blue machine from Try Hack Me. Uh, it's kind of an easy one, it's got a lot of users and it's really, really well known, it's kind of a good staple of Try Hack Me. The description is, deploy and hack into a Windows machine, leveraging common misconfiguration issues. So let's go check this out. Um... It has a nice, uh, I like this, like, default Windows XP banner. I love that. Um, and we can go take a look. Uh, what this machine is, is it's showcasing the Eternal Blue exploit, or MS-17-010-010, however you want to say that. Um, that was the exploit that kind of pseudo got released from the NSA with the Shadow Brokers thing, and eventually kind of made for that whole wanna cry ransomware. So it's a big deal, uh, breaks into a whole lot of Windows machines with some SMBV1 stuff and misconfiguration. It'll essentially just grant you system access. So if you can point it at the machine and SMP is open, then you can go ahead and roll through it. So anyway, let's dive into it. This machine was created by Darkstar. He's one of the admins and over there at TryHackMe. Cool guy. And uh, the sequel to this machine, oh, I want to tackle that, is the Ice. That's uh, another rendition of this sort of thing that I definitely want to make a video on as well. So anyway, let's join this room and we can go ahead and deploy the machine so we can go ahead and access it. I'll hit that big green button to deploy, and let's go ahead and create uh, just a folder for us to work in. I'll dive into my terminal here. So move into the try hack me directory. I will sudo open VPN, our VPN key, so we can go ahead and connect to that try hack me network and then reach the machine. Uh, I'm using Terminator, that's how I'm splitting my screen, and I'll move the VPN way up to the top there. Let's make a directory for us to work in. I'll call it blue, just name the box, and I will get started with the readme because I think that's a good thing to do. You can kind of take notes of what everything that you're working on. I like to include my name and the date just because, hey, this is good note keeping for myself, and then we can go ahead and get started. So what is asked of us? We have the machine here the IP address, so I'll include that in our notes, and let's go ahead and make sure we can access it. I don't know if we can, maybe it's not up yet, or because it's Windows, maybe ping is turned off, we can give it a little bit more time, or we can just go take a look at what these challenges for us are. This says scan the machine. If you're unsure how to tackle this, I recommend checking out the room for the red path and map. You could totally take a hint here. Again, the whole idea is to learn. TryHack Me is super duper friendly in that regard. And that they'll willingly give you write-ups right away. Uh, even if you haven't solved the machine, you're just all about learning this thing. And uh, that's what we're here to do. So let's go back to it, see what we're working on. Scan the machine. It suggested using nmap, and I'll do that as well. Uh, maybe we're not getting the pings just back yet. So anyway, let's make an nmap directory. Let's go ahead and nmap. I'll use tac sc, tac sv, enumerate versions. I also want to output this to an nmap format because I think that's good to have our notes. And we still have our IP address in our clipboard, so I can just go ahead and paste that in. I'm getting a lot of YouTube notifications over here. It might be down or it's just not seeing pings. So let's add tac pn in there to kind of disregard those and just scan it anyway. Maybe the machine's just still not up, but we'll see if our ping is coming back. Still not, oh, there we go, there we go, now he's back. Okay, guess we don't need that tack PN. Regardless, that's a good, quick and easy one to just say, nmap, I don't care about your ping, just go ahead and hammer the thing, scan it. It's asking us to just scan the machine. Okay, so we can mark that as complete because we are running our nmap scan. It says, how many ports are open with a port number under 1,000? So nmap will go ahead and scan kind of the, most common a thousand ports I think it is I don't know if it goes all the way up to a thousand but anyway we'll see what results we get from nmap once that scan is done we can go ahead and work with it it says what is this machine vulnerable to answer in the form of ms blah 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 example of that okay so uh I will just discuss here for a little bit of learning I added an extra one there msf excuse me ms not talking about metasploit here smb server this knowledge base ms 17 critical is about eternal blue so this affects a lot of windows machines and it will immediately give you critical remote code execution so kind of a big deal um we can see where to track it down within metasploit and the try hack me room is really really good about actually giving you that information again try hack me is all about kind of guiding you and making sure that you learn so that's a big plus Okay, now our nmap scan has returned. We see some information here. We have these, and 445 isn't even showing right now. Kind of an oddball. 
maybe we should get a little bit more of that. Anyway, we can take a look at what we have here. We are still seeing some SMB OS discovery. So we've got Windows 7 Professional, Service Pack 1. Looks like the computer name is John PC. That might be a username, potentially. We could totally take advantage of that if that is, in fact, a username. And all these RPC ports, you may or may not kind of consider those real <laughs> if, if what you're working through it. You don't need those entirely. But 135 for MSRPC and 139 are pretty common between NetBIOS, and you'll see that a lot on Windows machines and with SMB running and open. Okay, that second Nmap scan returned for us. I just wanted to do that one more time because I wasn't seeing 445 open. And it, it looks like we also have 3389. So, so it's just kind of me knowing, hey, this machine is all about SMB and internal blue. So it looks like we could use 135, 139, 445, and 3389. It's asking for under 1,000 as the answer there. So it looks like we only want those three ports. So let's go ahead and submit that number three. And Trihagmi will tell me, sweet, that's the correct answer. Uh, what I'm going to do, again, just for my note keeping, is just kind of save this and slap it into our readme. Let's just say some code block here. We'll just include that. And we could say, what is this machine vulnerable to? So answer in the form of all of these things. And what I want to show you, if you don't already know, is that Nmap can do some crazy cool things with its scripting engine so you can use tac tac script and you can also specify what kind of script you want to run from that so you can use smb and smb with a prefix with an, kind of an asterisk or a wildcard here will run everything that could use as a script under that smb family so let me go ahead and fire that off and i think i could track down like nse scripts there we go yeah so there are tons of these over in user share Nmap, in my case, scripts all about VNC, all about TFTP, all about FTP, tons and tons of SC, um, Nmap scripting engine scripts that you can go ahead and check out and see what they're really doing. Um, let's look for those that have SMB in the name. So it'll look through all of these different things. 17010 is hopefully what it will trigger on. But let's take a look at what that script actually is and what it's doing. So we'll fire that up in Sublime Text. It looks like this is some cool cool stuff and if you want to do more research on the nmap scripting engine you absolutely could just a quick google search just to know what that sort of thing is and it'll explain hey this is one of the coolest things that nmap can do what is all of it you can obviously write your own you can grab some others but you'll typically want to activate it with tac tac script if you want to use a specific script and I ran a few of those with Tech SC, which is why you were able to see those results from the SMB host discovery or the SMB um, security mode, et cetera, et cetera, in time. It didn't go for anything that might have been intrusive or might do actual vulnerability scanning. So that's why when we're looking with SMB as a prefix, we'll also scan for that SMB vuln just there. We could use that as well. We could have used SMB hyphen vuln star. And then we might be able to get more specific stuff tailored to those results. We could simply run what we, or what I'm kind of guiding you to the answer here, that it is vulnerable to MS17010 or Eternal Blue. So, okay, that Nmap scan is taking way too long. Um, so we could drill down to use a specific one if we wanted to, just kind of being certain that, hey, this is what we're going to be working with. Um, we could run Nmap tax, tax script equals that guy on our IP address, but you can see I've been, hey, trying to check the status of that one, and it was just taking longer and longer and longer. So we could let that go. Um, let's grab this syntax, because we know that that's going to be the correct answer for what our try hack me room will be looking for. So we can go ahead and submit that. Perfect, and now we can move on to task two, which says gain access, exploit the machine and gain a foothold. It says start Metasploit, so we can go ahead and do that with MSF console. And it looks like our quick Nmap scan had ran just fine. So it is vulnerable to our MS17010 vulnerability, remote code execution in SMB version one. 
and it is clearly vulnerable with severe high risk critical remote code execution vulnerability. We can go ahead and abuse this because we do have Metasploit with a module has that intact. Um, let's go ahead and clear that terminal out and we'll wait to see if that big one finds any other vulnerabilities for us. But MSF needs to go ahead and spin up its own database and some web account stuff or whatever the things that it does. I tend to just kind of whack enter every time it needs to do that and just like, please give me my prompt. <laughs> and it will start the Metasploit framework console so we can say, yep, yeah, we did that. Fantastic. And it says, find the exploitation code we will run against the machine. What is the full path of that code? So we need to find the Metasploit module that can go ahead and exploit this vulnerability, MS17010 or Eternal Blue. So what we could do is we could literally search for MS17010, or you could search for Eternal Blue if you don't happen to have that kind of knowledge-based tag memorized. And there are a lot of options here. We have some auxiliary scanners that will simply verify, hey, is this going to be vulnerable to that? And we could, if, we could use that if we wanted to. Um, if you check out the options for what this has, it should just kind of ask for the R host. That's really the only one that's kind of necessary. So I will go ahead and say, yeah, let's set our R host to, I'll go grab the IP address here. Spit that in there, hit run, and then our, our plan, our auxiliary scanner will work through and says, hey, that is pretty likely vulnerable to that. Anyway, that's just scanning it, kind of the same thing that Nmap did. I think you can safely scan uh, for MS17010 vulnerabilities that are actually beating up the machine because um, using the exploit for Eternal Blue can sometimes over and over again cause a blue screen and kind of knock the box over. So anyway, we had scanned for Eternal Blue. We had searched for it so we could potentially find some exploit that will work here. We could just simply use kind of the most common one, exploit Windows SMB MS17010 Eternal Blue. And that is kind of the one that is, okay, average ranking. Um, I do tend to see the PS exec rendition of it that I think is the one that uses named pipes and is a little bit more stable and reliable. But anyway, let's go ahead and fire off this one because I think that's what it's asking for. We can go ahead and submit that. And yeah, that's all we need. So let's go ahead and use that module. We can check out the options to see what we need to supply. Looks like our host is the only one that is still a required parameter that doesn't have a setting. The R port is required, but that is by default 445, where SMB server message block typically listens on, and it will go ahead and verify the architecture and target, et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, we will need to go ahead and set that R host, but that is what this next question is asking for. It wants it in all caps, so we can go ahead and submit it. And let's set that R hosts, which I have in my history. Let's hit run or exploit that will go ahead and fire this off. It'll check it, determine that it is vulnerable, and it will kind of spam along. Send the exploit. Let's go ahead and hit completed. Yep, we did successfully run the exploit. And it says confirm the exploit has ran correctly. You might need to press enter for the DOS or DOS shell to appear and we can background that. Okay, so looking back at our exploit, now we do have kind of this win notification here and that we successfully were able to exploit it. And we do have a command shell open on the target on the box. You can see I'm in that C Windows System32 directory. Um, I do have cmd.exe DOS uh, execution and I can enter commands and do things on that target machine. So I could kind of jump around a little bit, type in who am I? Looks like I am the NT authority system. So we have full control over this machine just from that single exploit. And now we could see what else we wanted to do. Uh, it's a good idea at this point to try and escalate our shell or upgrade our shell because we have just regular cmd.exe. We're a little limited in what Metasploit could actually allow us to do because if we were to be using the Meterpreter shell, we could upload and download files. We could run some post-exploitation tools or scripts or other Metasploit modules. So that's something that we really want to do. So we can background, as I said, with Control-Z. And that might actually, depending on your shell, background the entire Metasploit program. So what I tend to like to do is just enter the command background. And now that will read, okay, that's something that we're actually going to background. Let me get back to that session and show you that one more time. 
interacting with session one. Okay, so background is not normally a command that cmd.exe would understand, typically in the Windows world, but because we're running within Metasploit, Metasploit will see that and understand it. And okay, oh, you do want to background and go back to your regular MSF prompt. So now we could run something like shell to meterpreter to actually upgrade and escalate our shell. So if you wanted to, you could literally just run or use shell to meterpreter. And try hack me goes through a little bit of a good explanation as to what you could be doing with that here in the in their tasks. Um, that's over an escalate section here. I've already filled a little bit of this out because I needed to restart some recording because the box is a little bit unstable. Uh, the free version makes this a little bit hard to do on try hack me. And I know obviously the eternal blue exploit itself might damage the machine a little bit. That's going to hurt. So we could be using that post multi managed shell to interpreter module, and that is what Metasploit's going to recommend for us when we try and use shell to interpreter. But just to make it a little bit easier on typing there, we don't need to include that entire path. If Metasploit knows that's so common, it'll go ahead and use that for us. So it puts us immediately in that module context. Now, the thing that we need to actually specify when we're working here is the session option, because it needs to know what session are you actually going to end up using. What session are you what session are you going to use that is right now regular shell cmd.exe that we want to upgrade to meterpreter? So we could set our session to any of the sessions that we have active right now. In our case, we'll want to use the ID, just that number one here, for that is our first shell that's open. So I could say set session to one, and then we could go ahead and hit run. I also learned another cool trick. You could use session tag u. And I will go ahead and upgrade that with the session ID. If we hit enter on that, uh, excuse me, sessions. I don't know why I do that all the time. It'll go ahead and automatically figure out, okay, this is what you're trying to do with the multi-managed shell to interpreter session. And it will go ahead and start the reverse TCP handler. It'll wait to go ahead and catch that and start a new exploit for you. And then you'll eventually have the interpreter callback. Uh, hopefully, right? We could check out sessions, and right now we don't have anything called back just yet. We could try and interact with our session number one. Who am I? Okay, and that's still alive, thankfully, so we can background that. And it looks like, okay, now it's finally coming along and that sessions tag you worked for us just as well. Or we could very well have just hit run or exploit from within the con context of our exploit uh, post multi-managed shelter interpreter. Anyway, now we can go check out our sessions because you see it opened session number two, which is running interpreter. So we could sessions tag I to interact with number two. And now you can see I am inside of interpreter prompt. I can get UID, which is kind of their equivalent to the who am I command. You can see we are still NT authority system. Awesome. So we could say, yep, we ran all that. Entered the session there, ran it. We might needed to, we might have needed to re-exploit the machine if things kind of fell apart, which it did in my case. So I know this one is a little bit sensitive and kind of broken. Verify that we've escalated the NT authority system. You can run get system to confirm this. So let's go ahead and do that. Get system will kind of by default try a couple different avenues and routes to determine or find some way to get the NT authority system account, maybe it'd do some UAC bypass or other things or pipe impersonation. Uh, in our case, we already were NT authority system, so we wouldn't need to run that, but again, confirm. So feel free to open a DOS shell via the command shell and run who am I, so we could do that. Shell will let you in to a small command prompt here, which you can hit who am I, and then you could control C to break out of that and it'll terminate that channel and throw you back into your interpreter session. So say that's done. List all the processes running the ps command. Just because we are system doesn't mean our process is. Find a process toward the bottom that is running as NT authority system and write down the process ID in the far left column. Okay, so just some learning, just some kind of understanding with what Metasploit and Interpreter is doing. Uh, if I run ps, you can see the process listing here. The parent, or excuse me, the PID, the process ID, and the PPID, the parent process ID, the name that's running the session, architecture, user, etc., and where that's running from. So if you wanted to, if it were kind of an unstable connection or you wanted to move to something else, you could use the migrate command. Migrate's pretty awesome because you could migrate into another process 
your interpreter session in memory could move and pull into something else. Um, if you wanted to use tack n, that'll let you specify a better one, uh, at least enter it by the name rather than just the process ID, because sometimes running PS and trying to track it down can be a little annoying. So I like to migrate to a capital N when log on .exe. That's normally a safe bet that's always running and still has some pretty crazy privileges, etc. So once that's going, we can say that that is completed. Oh, and it was actually asking us to migrate with migrate process ID. Fantastic. Note that that may or may not work. Migrating processes sometimes can be tough, but looks like ours ran successfully. So perfect. All right, now we can do some interesting things. We can go ahead and crack some information. Dump the non-default user's password and crack it. Within our elevated interpreter shell, run the command hash dump, and that will dump all the passwords of the users on the machine as long as we have the correct privileges to do so. So we could go ahead and run hash dump. And you can see that there is another user, John, in here, J-O-N. And we did see that earlier when we were looking at some of our Nmap scan results. So looks like that is the answer there. What is the name of that user? Copy this password hash to a file and research how to crack it. What is the cracked password? Okay. And we have his hash here. So I might actually just see if I can crack that with something online just to make a quick, easy one. Crack station, I think, can handle some NTLM stuff. So let's go ahead and paste that in. I am not a robot and it doesn't know what it is. So let me remove just that preceding section because that might be the empty thing. Okay, yeah, so ALQFNA22 is apparently his password. Great. We can go ahead and submit that. And we should probably be documenting everything that we've been doing, but hey, <laughs> John's password. And that is with no H in John's name. Okay. So now that we've got that cracking section done, we want to find flags. There are three flags planted on this machine. Uh, flag one, okay. It doesn't really give us any information. Um, check out the hints. Can you see it? I don't know what that means. Oh, it might be actually referring to the C drive because if we check out our current working directory, we are in C Windows System 32, but if we move all the way back to C, can check out the directory listing and we do have a flag one.txt file there. Okay, so we could cat that out flag one dot text and flag is access the machine. Okay, fantastic. looks like it just wanted us to submit the inside part in between the curly braces. So let's submit that. And then flag two, errata. Windows really doesn't like the location of this flag and can occasionally delete it and might be necessary in some cases to terminate, restart the machine. Oh geez, then rerun the exploit to find this flag. This is relatively rare, however it can happen. Okay, I wrote this I wish I wrote down where I kept my password. Luckily, it's still stored here on Windows. Okay, so this might be stored in the SAM configuration, right? So um, Windows SAM location, we could Google that. That is kind of the path that has all of the hashes that are stored for usernames and for users in, on the system. It's in C Windows System 32 config, so we can see if that exists. C Windows System 32 config. And I'm using forward slashes here, so I don't have to use the WW, or excuse me, the double backslash escape because you need to, in that we're working in Ruby, so you need to supply two backslashes if you actually end up using a backslash. DIR, let's see what we got. Oh, there's a flag two file here. Fantastic. Nope, it's not really there. Wait, did I type that right? Flag two, flag two dot text. There we go. SAM database elevated access. Cool. Thank goodness. When I did this originally, that flag was not there. And I was like, how am I going to show this in a video? <laughs> so cool. That one's good. And flag three. Okay. So let me showcase something that I actually kind of wanted to, um, in this video for this section, because Interpreter has something awesome called search where you can search for files here. And if you don't know how to use it, you can use search tag H. You can search inside a directory recursively or for a specific pattern. You typically use tag F and you can use the wild card or the asterisk to glob things. Um, by default, I think it starts either from where you are or from where you're going, but more it can do the entire file system. So we'll search for things that start with flag, right? Or flag.txt. And since I have a number in there, we could use flag uh, asterisk dot text, maybe. So let's do that. Let's use search tag f flag star dot text. And maybe this will track down where we found that flag one and that flag two. And it could tell us where flag three is. So this might take a little bit of time. I'm going to let this run and we'll see if it actually gets any results or if it's going to use from our current directory or not. 
it probably has to cache like just about everything. So maybe this will take some time. Okay, so it looks like it found those flags there. It found flag one, right where we found it earlier. Looks like it also found flag two, right where we were. And it found flag three in the documents of that John user. So we probably could have tracked that down if we did our own enumeration, manually looking for seeing, hey, what's in this user's directory? What stuff does I have, et cetera, et cetera. But there is flag three. So we could go ahead and try and cat that out. And I'll just show you that quick issue where we are not going to be able to find that file because we're using backslashes so we'll need to specify two backslashes in order to escape them and actually be able to read that out so flag admin documents can be valuable we can go ahead and grab that paste it in here and with that we have completed everything in the room and it says congratulations we did it you completed that room so that's that. Um, you could also, and I found this kind of interesting earlier when my flag two didn't spawn for me when I did this originally, I would search and I tried to look for things that didn't have that .txt extension. And eventually I was able to find something that was an LNK file or like a shortcut. And that was pretty cool because looking at that specific file, it would actually tell me, hey, this is the path, this is the location for that flag number two. So even without using that search function and flag two not spawning when I did this originally, then I could still know, okay, that's where that flag location actually is without looking at the hint, without, I don't know, looking at write-ups, et cetera, et cetera. So I hope those are some good nuggets. I hope those are some good tidbits for you. Um, once this returns, I'll show you that technique. Okay, there we go. Now we got our results back. We saw the flag one text itself, two, three text itself, etc. cetera. Um, but we were able to find these LNK files, which are acting like small shortcuts for us. So this flag, this file did stay intact when I previously did this and that flag two file hadn't spawned for me. So what I had done, and I'll show you this, is just simply cat this out and type this out. Again, if I copy and paste, I need to throw in these escaped backslashes, use a pair of them here, and and now you'll see a lot of nonsense, right? Because a lot of this isn't printable characters. It's kind of like a compiled binary, not a compiled file, right? But it's using some raw bytes that aren't printable. And we can see, oh, this is the current path. Windows system 32 config flag 2.txt. And that is where that would actually be stored even if that flag hadn't spawned. So kind of cool, good trick. I hope that search tack F syntax can be handy for you inside Meterpreter. And maybe you hadn't heard of that before. I hope that's uh, what we're doing here, what we're learning for this video. So that's that. That is the blue machine from Try Hack Me. Sorry for kind of the bumps in the video editing on this. Uh, I, I needed to redo this a little bit of time and then someone started like mowing their lawn outside and it was just awful. I rage quit a little bit, <laughs> um, but... Thank you guys for watching. I really recommend if you're playing a CTF or you're doing some cheesy pen test video game, not a video game, <laughs> just a hack quest competition, a King of the Hill event. I don't know what you're doing, but if you see a Windows machine, if it looks kind of old, if it has got, if it's got 445 open, if SMB is open and listening, maybe it's SMB v1. It's worth a try. Check that auxiliary script, determine if it's vulnerable, and then fire away for Eternal Blue. It's a quick and easy win, and that's pretty awesome. So. Thank you guys so much for watching. I really hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please do press that like button. If you didn't like the video, I don't know what to say. <laughs> All right. Thank you guys. I appreciate it. Like, comment, subscribe, the YouTube algorithm thing. See you on Discord, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, all those internet things. Bye. I love you. I'll see you in the next video.